This is episode 152 of the Prepper Website Podcast. Today's articles are The Reluctant Spouse, Part 1, Three Approaches to Bridge the Gap, Electromagnetic Pulse, EMP, What You Need to Know. Hey, I'm Todd Sepulveda, the editor of PrepperWebsite.com. This podcast is an audible version with some commentary of articles that have been posted on Prepper Website, a daily curation of preparedness information. These articles are some of the best of the best that have been recently posted on PrepperWebsite.com. All article links and show information can be found on the PrepperWebsitePodcast.com. Hey, before we get started, just uh, want to you know ask you to keep uh, Puerto Rico and you know the Virgin Islands and all those guys in your prayers. Um, the uh, you know th- I was looking at the Drudge Report you know because they were hit by Hurricane uh, Maria today. And uh, just recently, I guess the uh, Drudge Report must have refreshed because uh, it said uh, could be without power for six months. Uh, and so they're, they're saying like uh, lines, power lines were, were dug up, uh, all kinds of things were, you know, even phone lines and stuff like that. Uh, I know our, our denomination had put out a, uh, a post on Facebook uh, that they're, you know, praying for the missionaries that we have in Puerto Rico because uh, they haven't been able to talk to them. And, and I think I mentioned it yesterday, yesterday that one of the guys that um, works in the cafe, that his, he's from Puerto Rico and his family is from Puerto Rico. And so he was, you know, today he was very, very nervous. I mean, of course, everyone knows, uh, you know, they're asking him how, how are things. And he's like, of course, he hasn't heard. So, um, you know, we, I just feel sorry for the guy because I could see it in his face. He's usually a very happy, uh, you know, happy guy. He's always smiling, you know, and, and talking to you. And, but uh, today I, I could just tell that he was just uh, a little worn down, uh, worrying and, and thinking about all that kind of stuff. I mean, they're saying that the island is destroyed. I mean, I was looking on Twitter and uh, you know some of the, the video on there, and uh, it's just, it's bad, very bad. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, and then, you know, um, the United States is not completely out of the woods yet. I mean, they're tracking that this, that the storm is going to go straight north, uh, but it could, if it starts to veer off again, I'm, you know, uh, listening to Ben over at Suspicious Observers. And with all the solar activity that we've been seeing, if it goes over to uh, it goes a little west, it definitely could be hitting the United States and it has a long trek to continue to go west. So, um, you know, we need to be keeping that in our prayers as well, that uh, it goes off into the Atlantic and goes off to Never Never Land and, uh, you know, keeping people in Mexico as well. There's just so many things. I, I don't ever remember a time when there's been so many things that have uh, that have gone on and just, uh, uh, you know, all at the same time is just crazy. So uh, today is a special day uh, or a special podcast, I guess. I'm recording uh, not only my desktop, but I am recording also the Facebook uh, on Facebook Live. So it looks like it's it's going all right. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't look like I'm, I'm having any problems. So hopefully my uh, my little computer can uh, catch up or keep up. Let me say. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into our first article of the podcast. It comes to us from Beans, Bullets, Bandages, and You.com. And this article is entitled, again, The Reluctant Spouse, Part 1, Three Approaches to Bridge the Gap. I think this is an important article because uh, from my from my experience and done some polls out there, uh, there's a lot of preppers that are solo or, or uh, you know, they they – you know, their, their spouses are okay with what they're doing, or maybe they're doing it in secret. Uh, they wish their family was behind them. Uh, and this kind of covers it a little bit, kind of gives you some insight. Uh, part two is also on the Prepper website or on PrepperWebsite.com. And so you can go check that one out and uh, go see, go see, uh, go read that one. But there's some resources here that you might want to you know, think about in some ways that you can approach the topic with your spouse uh, I've talked about my, uh, you know, my preparedness and how, uh, you know, kind of got my wife on board. I mean, she's not full fledged, you know, prepper like uh, there's a lot of other people out there uh, who are, you know, couples. And, and even uh, when we're talking about Salty and Spice who run uh, bullets, uh, beans, bullets, bandages and you, uh, you know, they're both you know kind of on board. I'm actually going to be talking about a little podcast that they do here to talk about this subject and um but, you know, but for the most part, you know, we're all on the same page, which is great. Uh, but anyway, so let's go ahead and start reading this article. As in every other aspect of life as a couple, things go along much faster and more smoothly if spouses basically agree on goals and means. 
So what's a person who sees a need to prep to do when a very important person in their life does not see the value? Find out why spouse is reluctant. There are lots of reasons why a person might be reluctant to prep for a potential disaster. Knowing what's driving it in your favorite human is well worth the time and effort. Sometimes to figure this out, all you have to do is ask. If I may send a special note to the men out there, men, it's truly admirable and in some ways quite charming how dedicated guys can be to rescuing women they care about. So I'm in no way going to speak badly about that drive. Please keep in mind, though, that women on average are more focused on communication prior to jumping right in and fixing stuff. Many of us also find it especially charming when you take the time to help us feel heard and understood. If you open this conversation, please let her really get her thoughts out and let you know you heard and understand before you jump in with the solutions and counter arguments. Might even be worth it to separate the hearing and understanding and offering counter arguments into two separate conversations. That way, it feels less like the question was just a ploy to get an opening to start the fixing. We made this clicky podcast for you to play for your reluctant spouse. So in the uh, in the article, you can go ahead and click on this uh, link and it's going to open up to another uh, another article. And it is there is a podcast here. So episode 33 and it says play this podcast for your reluctant spouse. And so what it is, um, I guess, uh, salty. Uh, I'm sorry, spice. It's, it's salty and spice are both on the podcast, but spice is, uh, you know, they, they both say that this podcast is not for preppers. It is for those uh, who are reluctant spouses. And so basically, you know, you can uh, play this for your spouse and and hopefully they would, uh, you know, be a little bit more open to preparedness. But you have that resource there. So here, here are some ways that you can help, um, some ways that you can kind of, well, I'm sorry, no, before we get to that, um, let's let's continue reading. There are three steps. They talk about three steps here in this article that you can use, but uh, I was uh, getting ahead of myself. Okay, so watch for camouflage. Oh, how much easier life would be if people would just say what they mean all the time. That's not this world, though. And I've got to admit, women are worse about this than men on average, perhaps because it's often used as a strategy to reduce conflict. If you reasonably address what your spouse says is the objection and said spouse resists anyway, perhaps there's some camouflage going on. The spouse is listing what seems to be a more defensible reason than the real one. Sometimes the spouse doesn't even realize the misdirection going on. When we don't want to think about something, it's easy to make up excuses as to why we shouldn't think about it. Fear especially can lead people into the avoidance strategy. You understand the objection, now what? There are three general approaches to get someone else to buy in on your point of view, and you do want buy-in rather than sullen, quiet resistance or some other unpleasantness in the household, I'm pretty sure. Mix and match for your situation. The avalanche. Only has a hope if your spouse has an open enough mind. Address the key objections fairly but convincingly. Not sure how? A companion post. The Reluctant Spouse Part 2 will follow this one shortly and share some ideas. And so, like I said, uh, that post is already on Prepper website. You can go check that one out. Erosion takes time, but it's taken down some very impressive mountains. In this approach, you take opportunities to add to your argument as life presents opportunities. Is your spouse reading about the stories of hurricane evacuees and their problems getting gas? Hey, spouse, would it be so much less stressful if we need to evacuate if we had a couple of cans of gas ready in the garage and a bag with travel necessities? If using these openings causes spouse's nostrils to flare and ears to smoke, you might be going a little heavy handed. Be the change is one of my favorite approaches to life in general. If you think people ought to do a thing, well, you're people too, you're people too so you can make a start at it. I would not recommend hiding your prepping from your spouse. We prep in part to not lose what's important to us. Yes, that should include people. But in most relationships, there are areas where one spouse leaves the other to do their own thing and you can make prepping your thing. When it comes in handy, our preps do all the time and or when your spouse sees you really value it, spouse might join in. If not, you're better off than if neither made an effort. So uh, again, there's links here to part two, so you don't have to go to Prepper website. 
unless you uh, you know you're listening to this on on your uh, on your podcast catcher. Uh, you can hit that very quickly. But if you go to this, uh, the link, the article link, you can go ahead and link to part two. You can also link to the podcast. There are some comments here where people have some differing opinions. And I really like Spice's uh, approach to to one of the answers. So uh, I really do appreciate that one there. So um, I, I think this is very, very uh, if you're having if you need to have this conversation, this is one uh, you're at one point right now in time where it'd be very, very easy to do it. So you're talking about, you have all these natural disasters going on. You got fires, which I am not hearing anything about. If you you guys, if you're in Montana and you're in Oregon and y'all, you guys, I mean, I haven't seen anything on the fires lately, which is, is crazy. I mean, I know that they just haven't gone out. So we got the fires going on. We've got all the destruction and all that on the, on the Gulf coast. We have everything going on in Florida. We have stuff going on in, you know, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and those kind of things going on. And so now is the time to just like just very, you know, easily to bring up and say, hey, um, you know, I've been thinking about all these things that are going on. I'd like to be a little bit better prepared in case the situation happens. It it seems like something, you know, it seems like the earth is going crazy. So I don't know that, you know, whatever is in your situation, you might be in Tornado Alley. uh, You might experience those kinds of things. You might be uh, up north where it snows really heavily and you might want to be better prepared for a snowstorm. Uh, You know, those are things that you can start to bring out. And the fact if you're up north and the fact that we are going, you know, going into wintertime, uh, that's something that you can kind of bring up. But uh, I, I, you know, I think it helps. I mean, like I said, the the thing that um, I said this before, the thing that really helped uh, kind of get my wife on board is we were watching the the after Armageddon. And then the kind of thing that they really got my kids to think about it was we watched. uh, I had them all sit down because I had done a review on American Blackout for uh, National Geographic, and I asked them all to sit down and, and to watch it. And so, uh, I mean, they, it kept their attention. And so, you know, we've always, we've always talked about things openly, and so that always helps. But uh, if you're coming from that point of concern, uh, that might be uh, one of the, the biggest uh, or the easiest ways to go. But uh, you might want to try some of uh, Spice's uh, some of her her approaches down here the avalanche the erosion or or the change all right so that's over at beans bullets bandages and you you can go check that out all right so taking a little break here all right so okay so you're seeing some snow on the on the on the camera justin i see that all right i see a little bit um I guess there's a little bit of snow there, but uh, is it is the sound quality coming coming through pretty good? Can you tell me that? Anyone? 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 Bueller. <clears throat> well, I'll know soon enough if the sound quality is coming. Hey, Jamie, how's it going? Um, it's all good. Okay. All right, Justin. Thanks. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, continue on. Good sound. All right. All right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and do this next one on EMP, and uh, I will be back on that one. I guess that's something that I should have put in the uh, in the description, what articles that I was reading. But I will uh, put those. I'm going to go ahead and put those in there now. How about that? The, this EMP one is pretty good. Um, I think it was written by, um, I think the person who wrote it is, it's Lori's husband over at uh, Common Sense Homesteading. I don't know. Does that go in? Yeah, there it goes. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start on this next one. All right, our next article comes to us from Common Sense Homesteading, and that's commonsensehome.com. And uh, this is an article on electromagnetic pulse and what you need to know. And I think there's some interesting, you know, there's some interesting takes here. Um, I haven't really seen these uh, statistics here um, and some differences between um, like a nuclear EMP and then, of course, uh, a solar uh, CME or solar EMP. 
Um, they refer to it that way in this article. Um, actually, they refer to it both. Um, but anyway, so I, I think this is uh, Lori's husband that's writing it, August Neverman. And so uh, anyway, uh, interesting take on it. So I thought I would read this one because EMP seems to be a very interesting um interesting topic all the time on Prepper website. It, I know that uh, w when I link to uh, an EMP article, it's going to get a lot of hits and probably more than likely this podcast will receive a lot of hits as well because people will be interested in the EMP. So I'm going to go ahead and read this article and I will come back at the, at the end and just kind of give some comments. So let's go ahead and get started on this one. This post is part of our Common Sense Preparedness series where where our goal is to help you be prepared for whatever life throws at you. EMP or electromagnetic pulse has been in the news lately with the posturing of North Korea and active solar flares. This post discusses different types of EMPs, what damage they may cause and actions, if any, that you can take to prevent problems or deal with them if and when they occur. What is an EMP or electromagnetic pulse? An EMP or electromagnetic pulse is a wave of, of electromagnetic radiation. An EMP will not directly hurt people, but an EMP interacts with power lines, metal and electronics and causes power spikes, or in more severe cases, failure. A large EMP could knock out power or kill electronics. An EMP can be caused by many things, but the two most likely reasons for an EMP are a nuclear explosion or a solar flare. And so there is a nice little graphic here that has uh, you know high altitude EMP solar superstorms and uh, talks a little bit about that there so you might want to go check that one out so what could an EMP damage an EMP could damage TVs radios and other broadcast equipment power grid transformers and substations telephones like landlines and mobile phones vehicle and aircraft control systems computers and all internet connected devices refrigerators generators pretty much anything electronic or powered by electricity. What is the difference between solar and nuclear EMP? A nuclear EMP is a more energetic and shorter burst. A solar flare EMP is also known as a coronal mass ejection or geomagnetic storm. They can vary widely in intensity from simply causing bright northern lights to destroying some, of, some or all of the power grid. Solar flares can last much longer than nuclear EMPs. And so there is another, uh, another graphic here that you'll want to check out. Nuclear EMP summary, high altitude EMP. With the proliferation of nuclear weapons, the likelihood of a nuclear EMP increases. A nuclear EMP requires a nuclear weapon delivered by a rocket, high flying aircraft or ICBM. The nuke is detonated high in the air. Worst case, the nuke is detonated in the upper atmosphere, approximately 20 miles up. A large nuclear EMP like this would be a very would be very serious. A nation state or rogue state is the most likely cause of an atmospheric EMP. The nuclear explosion itself would create little to no physical destruction, but it would create a widespread EMP and some limited fallout. The EMP would destroy or at least damage the electrical grid. It would also destroy electronics within the pulse area. Nearly all vehicle with electronic systems would fail when exposed to the EMP. Basically, a large-scale nuclear EMP damages or destroys all non-shielded electronic devices, cell phones, refrigerators, generators, inverters, TVs, radios, cars, etc., within a 500 to 1,000 mile radius in a few seconds. Note, in tests of nuclear weapons, the EMP doesn't expand in simple circles. The Earth's magneto magnet magnetosphere deflects the blast, causing the waves to spread more strongly away from the poles. The pulse is concentrated more strongly in a, in a semicircular band as shown in the image above. How long will it take to recover from nuclear EMP? The time to recover from a nuclear EMP could be days, weeks, or months, depending on the scope, location, size, and type of explosion and altitude of the attack and the scope of damage to the electrical grid and technology infrastructure nas nationally. A nuclear electromagnetic pulse would very likely destroy a massive number of electronic devices within the range of the EMP blast. The biggest fear is multiple atmospheric nuclear bursts. Multiple bursts would likely destroy the entire power grid. A total power grid failure would require years of recovery work. 
And so that's one of the things that I want to come back and talk about here uh, at the end of the article. Could a surface nuclear blast cause an EMP? A terrorist group would have trouble successfully setting off a high altitude air burst and would likely use a ship and float in a nuke to a major port city. The lower altitude greatly restricts the range of the EMP damage, but increases local physical damage and radiation. This means that a surface burst EMP is serious, but unlikely and localized. A dirty bomb would tend to be devastating locally, but would not result in widespread EMP. See also nuclear radiation exposure dealing with radiation risk. So there's a link there for you to click on. Nuclear EMP details. The amount of energy created in a nuclear EMP is difficult to calculate, but we can estimate based on historical tests. A 1.44 megaton bomb test called Starfish Prime was detonated in 1962, about 400 kilometers or 250 miles in the mid-Pacific Ocean. The detonation caused electro electric damage 900 miles away in Hawaii. If the same 1.4 megaton nuke was detonated off the U.S., it's it is estimated it would have created a 22 to 30 kilovolt meter pulse at the core of its blast. A modern hydrogen bomb in, is 50 megatons, so the amount of EMP from one of these would be 40 times more than what occurred in 1962. Aircraft may be impacted, but the metal fuselage would function partially as a Faraday cage, so aircraft would not necessarily be susceptible. The electronics in a car or truck would likely survive a 0.25 kilovolt meter EMP blast, especially if it's not running, but higher than a 0.25 kilovolt meter uh, would damage or destroy the electronics. The distance from the detonation will determine the amount of damage to electronics, but ultimately the area in the blast would very likely see total electric grid failure. A functional vehicle would not necessarily do you any good if the gas stations can't pump. So there's a, there is a, uh, a graphic here that has the different uh, electrical grids in the United States broken up. Uh, I guess there's a Quebec interconnection. I've never seen that one there. But, uh, you know, you have pretty much uh, the Western interconnection, the Eastern interconnection. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, Texas, the ERCOT inter interconnection. All right, so solar flare summary. Scientists would detect a coronal mass ejection and have time to issue a warning. It takes about five days for a CME to reach Earth. The CME would create a geomagnetic storm or EMP on Earth. It is effectively a massive extended duration EMP caused by the sun. Okay, just I'm not going to trust or wait for scientists to tell me. That's why I listen to people like Ben over at Suspicious Observers. That's just my two cents. Um, a, larger, a large event would destroy some of, or all of the high voltage backbone transformers. These transformers are critical to the U.S. electrical grid. Even if only a few hundred of the larger transformers were destroyed, it could disable the entire interconnected system for weeks or even months. Small electronics would be unlikely to be damaged in the way a nuclear EMP could cause damage. How long would it take to recover from solar EMP? The recovery time for an EMP could be days to weeks for a small EMP or months to years for a large EMP. The effects of an EMP vary widely depending on the scope, weather, grounding location, intensity, and length of the burst. The largest risk is damage to the electric grid and technology infrastructure. A major EMP would likely result in damage to our power grid and communications equipment. It would not kill people directly, but the resulting loss of power and communication would be horrible. Solar flare details. A solar flare or coronal mass ejection created by the sun through normal activity results in electromagnetic radiation that travels through space. That solar CME wave results in an EMP if it hits our atmosphere. Small solar flares hit Earth regularly, but medium ones are rare and huge ones are extremely rare. A big solar flare could occur anytime and they are highly unpredictable and extremely rare. The largest recorded CME was the 1859 Carrington event. It lasted multiple days and impacted the entire planet. It caused telegraph wires to burst into flames, starting fires along their runs. Telegraph machines scorched paper printouts, gave operators electric shocks, and transmitted gibberish. Telegraphs continued working for hours, even after being unplugged from the batteries that powered them. For two days, the light show and electromagnetic storm continued then faded. A repeat of this event would be devastating to our modern global electronics 
dependent environment, impacting part or all of the entire planet. More recent events, in 1979, there was a small solar flare that caused Toronto to be without power for an entire day. There was also a small, a smaller flare that knocked out power in the entire province of Quebec in 1989. The odds of these events are hard to predict, but the likelihood is as high as one in eight for the next 10 years. Can you protect devices from an EMP? Somewhat. You can shield or protect devices by building a Faraday cage using a conductive metal container that is grounded, grounding a shell around them and isolating them from the electromagnetic radiation or power spikes, and using industrial grade ground fault isolation. Again, you need to decide are you prepping for a short term weeks, long-term, months, or global event. Here are some other basic protection options. Foil wrap. A simple Faraday cage can be made by completely covering an object with aluminum foil. Wrap your radio with cloth or other insulation, then wrap that with a double layer of aluminum foil to ensure no gaps. Ensure that this shell is well grounded. A garbage can or other metal container. A large, fairly cheap Faraday cage can be a steel garbage can with a couple of grounding rods. The steel of the garbage can interacts with the EMP and creates a voltage current spike that is then grounded, protecting whatever is inside the garbage can. A Faraday cage can be used to store radios, electronics, and other susceptible electronic devices. Metal roof. A house with an extremely well-grounded metal roof could protect from an EMP depending on the power of the pulse because it could effectively shield the house by interacting with EMP and then redirecting the resulting voltage or current spike to the heavy ground wires like lightning. A multi-day solar flare would create ongoing voltage and current. A nuclear explosion could create a spike more like a lightning strike, independently hitting everything within line of sight. A metal roof alone doesn't fix the problem because power line spikes could negate any benefit a metal roof would provide. Purpose-made purpose containers. And so there's two links here that you can look at, EMP protection bags and large electromagnetic pulse protection bags. How to prepare for an EMP. The best course of action for most people is to focus on events such as a 72-hour power outage or a one to two week outage. Short duration trouble is more likely than long-term problems and easier to prep for. It is possible that a global event could occur through a major meteor storm, gamma burst, major volcanic activity, or any number of other cat catastrophic but less likely. Prepping for a small event or small EMP. <laughs> Prepare as you would for a hurricane or other natural disaster. Have at least 72 hours of supplies, depending on your location and how likely you are to see a return to normalcy. Stockpile food and water, fuel prescriptions, general medical supplies, personal hygiene items, the basics you need to survive, plan for cooking, shelter, self-defense, heating, cooling, handling medical emergencies, and garbage disposal. And see, and then there's the three links here, 20 things I wish I had before the flash flood emergency, when the power grid fails, and storage shelf life at, of over-the-counter medication. There's a lot of overlap between different types of emergency preparedness. Preparing for a larger EMP. This is harder. The time to recover from a large EMP would depend on location and could be weeks to many months or in a worst case scenario years. There would also be chaos as supplies dwindle and the military would likely be called in to maintain order. We've all seen how quickly grocery stores empty during emergencies and supply lines would be cut. You would likely need four months to over, over a year of supplies. Effectively, you would need to be prepared to live without power, like living off grid for a few months to a year or more. If you are preparing for a nuclear EMP, the recovery time would be quicker. For a big solar EMP or multiple nuclear bursts, think no power for a long time. With a global multi-day major solar flare CME EMP, it would be many months or even years before we would recover. Basically, you would need to prepare to live an 1800s lifestyle, wood stove, hand tools, no power. Have tools and equipment necessary to garden, hunt, prepare food without electricity or gasoline, stockpile books, tools, medicine, and learn a lot of skills. The other option is to store a completely protected and isolated power generation system, solar, biodiesel equipment, gasification, wind, etc., and know how to put it together after the event. If you are planning on keeping modern conveniences, you will need to, you would need 
a full electrical power generation system protected from the EMP, a Faraday cage around solar panels, biodiesel equipment, and or wind generator are your best bet since you won't be able to get gasoline or natural gas. Box up everything electrical in Faraday cages. Practical things you can do that would help in small and large emergencies. Communications. Consider joining regional and national emergency communications such as your local ARES or RACES program. ARES equals Amateur Radio Emergency Services, RACES equals Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. Get a shortwave radio and EMP protected. More information here. So there's a link that you can click on. Medical. Get first aid and medical training and you can use those skills for a storm, EMP, or a car accident. See Red Cross training programs, YMCA or YWCA, or check out your local Votech schools, participate with your local EMTs, volunteer to assist in local preparedness exercises, buy or build a first aid kit that would serve you, your family, and if you have the funds, your community. Shelter. If you don't have basic carpentry skills, consider learning those skills. Get supplies and tools necessary to repair, improve, or worst case, create shelter. Get camping gear. A tent inside a cold house will stay warmer than the house alone or the tent outside. See winter storm survival, keeping you and your home warm when the power goes out for more information on sheltering in place. Food. Stockpile at least three days of the food you regularly eat. Once you have three days, build up to three weeks and so on. See top 10 real foods to store without electricity. Storage food is useful for a snowstorm, tornado, short power outage, or even simply feeding your family while you hunt for a new job. Don't forget a way to cook your food too. See emergency cooking, 10 ways to have a hot meal when the power goes out for more information. For those who have livestock or pets, don't forget about their needs too. Water. Store at least a week of water or have a guaranteed way to get water without electricity. Get a bathtub water bladder and fill it immediately after any power event or before if you have warnings such as a snowstorm or solar EMP. Purchase a Berkey water filter or other water gravity fed filtration system. The higher end filters are good for an EMP or any other natural disaster. You must have one gallon of potable drinkable water person per day. Life straw personal water filters to carry instead of water. See emergency water storage and filtration, what you need to know before emergencies hit. Again, if you have livestock or pets, plan for their needs too. Hand pumps and large scale water storage will be essential for larger numbers of animals or large animals. Basic tools and supplies. Get a good basic toolkit, hammer, knife, screwdrivers, etc. Ensure you have tarps, duct tape, and fire extinguishers. Consider other items like a bike pump and a crank cell phone charger, flashlight, radio. Think about what wood you need if the power was out for days or weeks. Think about people powered options for making basic repairs. Defense. Consider firearms. Emergency services such as the police will likely be overwhelmed and difficult to reach. If you obtain a firearm, get proper training to use and maintain it. If you don't feel confident with a firearm or they are prohibitive, prohibited in your area, consider other options such as a prep, pep, pepper spray, but be aware that those causing trouble will likely be armed. Um, yeah, there's a lot I can say on that, but I'm just going to continue going. Establish good relations with the neighbors before emergency situations hit so you know someone has your back and you have theirs. Power. It is possible a household generator would still function after a small EMP, so having the generator and some extra gas could allow you to have limited power while the grid is repaired. This would be useful in storms also. A solar USB charger can keep devices that survive the blast running without grid electricity. Be hygiene. Be prepared for toilets to stop functioning. You can use waste bags that fit into a conventional toilet or a dedicated emergency toilet. See DIY portable toilets plus tips to get rid of smells for detailed emergencies uh, to uh, emergency tips. Consider a gravity fed solar shower and make sure you have a clean source of water for hand washing. Solar ovens can do double duty cooking food and sterilizing water. What you need to do for EMPs and other large disruptions. The basics are still the best. Be prepared. Have water stored and water filtration available. Stockpile the foods you eat regularly and rotate your stock. Determine your most basic shelter and clothing needs. Learn necessary skills such as first aid training to take care of yourself, your family, and your community. Many of us have seen firsthand how emergencies bring out the best and worst in people. Having the tools and skills you need to get things done 
is never a bad investment. All right, so there are some uh, there are some uh, comments there that you can go check out. And uh, the uh, the author of the article, uh, August Neverman, he um, he responded, and so you can actually, I mean, you can continue to go there. I'm sure he'll still answer your questions if you have EMP question. Okay, so um, so let me start on this on this article. Just give a little bit of commentary. Um, the first thing is this. So a lot of the times when you hear EMP, solar, CME, whatever, solar flare, all that kind of stuff, immediately people think that you're going to be blasted into the 1800s. What August is saying here in, in his article is that there's different levels of uh, destruction, right? Uh, depending on the, the, the actual CME pulse, how long it, it actually goes for, uh, how big of a solar flare it was. Um, and then you have the nuclear EMP, you know, it depends on how powerful uh, the, the, the bomb was, how high it was in the atmosphere. Um, you know, was it directly over the United States? Would it take out the whole United States? You know, all those kinds of things. And so you, you have this, this thing, you know, again, so people hear solar flares, EMP, um, CMEs, all that kind of stuff. And then they immediately, immediately say, you know, we're going back to the Stone Age. I think there's still a lot of um, misunderstanding of what exactly would happen because it's hard to uh, to test what a solar flare would really do or what a, what uh, an EMP would really do, especially in today's modern uh, you know modern society. Uh, one of the things that I did that I was going to do is I was going to link over on Prepper website. Uh, I have a, the tag cloud. And so every article that has been linked on Prepper website is linked on the tag cloud. So I was going to link to EMP and uh, then you you could go crazy if you were interested in EMPs. You could go research and go read all the articles you could possibly find. You would, you would overdo it. And I'm going to tell you not to overdo it, but uh, you could overdo it. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to link to the main tag cloud and it's all in alphabetical order. And so uh, you can just go and click on whatever topic you want and go for it from there. One of the things that I recently did was uh, I wrote an article and did a video on, uh, you know, I've, we've been going at this for a while on Prepper website and some of the websites that we link to that they're gone. And so um, there's a way to get around that. Uh, if, if even if a website is gone, you can still get to the article and you can still get to the information. Uh, and so uh, there is on the very top of the tag cloud, um, there are some asterisks there. And then you can click on that link and it, you can go to my um, my post that shows you how to access articles that have been gone from, uh, you know, that I guess websites that have shut down and uh, don't want, you know, th they're not up and, and around anymore. So uh, you can go check that out at the tag cloud. And like I said, you can research any uh, any topic in preparedness that you want. And so if you're watching the video there, you can see that there's tons of things there for you. But anyway, so let's go back to, uh, let's get back to this, uh, this electromagnetic pulse. Um, there's been a lot of articles over the years that there's just so many different views on it. So I, I kind of like what August is saying here that the, there's that possibility that there's, there's these wide ranges. I mean, you could have a partial uh, you know, some devices might go down, uh, maybe not all of them, maybe devices that are plugged into the grid. Um, you know, who, who knows? Who knows what it might be? So, I mean, something to consider, you know, should you have, uh, you know, a Faraday cage? Should you have some electronics put back? Quite possibly. Um, one of the things that you hear and one of the things that I have heard on Prepper website for many, many years, as I've read different articles, is people say, that if you prepare for an EMP or a solar flare, then you then you're prepared for anything, which that is possibly true. The thing is, is that to really prepare for an EMP, and um, you know, like uh, the EMP commission that did their article or did their review and their research and their information that was kind of put out the same time that the 9/11 commission did theirs, so it really didn't get too much uh, play out in the media, although. Um, you know, with uh, you, you preppers, preppers know about it. Um, but, you know, they I, they say like within a year, like 90 percent of the population would be dead. Right. And so when someone says, that, you know, if you prepare for, you know, the rate, way to prepare for uh, if you prepare for an EMP, you're prepared for anything. The, the fact is, is that there's no way that you can prepare for an EMP 
or a solar flare, solar flare CME for the big one, the one that's going to knock you back to the 1800s. The only way to do that would be is that if you were living, if you were already living off grid and uh, you had everything you needed to live off grid, you didn't go to the store for anything. You didn't, I mean, you did everything on your own. I guess kind of like the Amish, uh, maybe. Uh, the problem is, is that in an EMP or solar flare, if we really went, you know, we really went down that road, I would suspect that, you know, Amish farms would be overrun with people. And, uh, you know, they would, they would probably be harmed and killed so people could have their stuff. And then it would just be temporary until because people don't know how to survive and live like that, you know, without modern conveniences of life. So that's really the only way to survive um, the big EMP. I mean, you can you can try to be as self-sufficient as possible. But if we're going back to the 1800s, you're going to have to get those skills really, really quickly. So if you live in the suburbs or you live in the city, I mean, things will break down. Now, I know that August is saying here, you know, things might get repaired in days or weeks or months. That's not what a lot of people believe. A lot of people believe it's like you're out for the count. And so you got to weigh all those kinds of things and see, you know, see how your those kinds of things are going to happen and, and, and have a plan, right? Now, what they do at the end of this article, what August does at the end of this article is he's talking about basic preparedness. So when he's talking about all that, uh, you know, food and hygiene and water and communications and me medical and shelter and all that, that's just basic preparedness. And so really, for those of you who might be new to preparedness and the EMP thing kind of freaks you out, don't let it freak you out. What you want to do is you want to start your plan. Just like anything else, you want to have a preparedness plan and you want to start building on that plan. And so when he says here, you know, start with three days of food and then build on top of that, that's what you want to do. And so you can be as prepared as possible for the EMP, solar flare, whatever. But while you're doing that, you are prepared for a snowstorm or a hurricane or, you know, flooding. If you're, you know, power grid. Uh, your electric goes off for a while, you know, you, you, you can be prepared for, you know, any job loss, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, being prepared, you want to just kind of continue to add to your preps as you go. So starting small and building upon those kinds of things and, and building more and more and more uh, in, in what, however you, you see it. You know, a lot of people will say, I'm not preparing for an EMP. I'm preparing for those small events, right? I'm preparing for, you know, the hurricane, the tornado. I'm preparing for, uh, you know, massive rainfall, uh, those kinds of things. I'm preparing for a job loss, um, you know, all those, all those things out there. And so just, you want to have a plan and you want, you know, we, we know that so much, uh, on the podcast and on Prepper website, you want to have a plan and you start from a plan and you move from there and you build upon that. You cannot go from zero to EMP preparedness, you know, in six months, that's not going to happen or three months or whatever. Uh, it's going to, it's going to take uh, a while. So you need to build upon that. Um, so don't let the EMP, CME, solar flare thing freak you out. Uh, I do think, though, that this might, this is getting a little bit more play where, you know, solar flares, the uh, EMP or the electrical grid, right, is getting a little bit more play because of all the cyber attacks uh, that are out there. We know that in the Ukraine, uh, their their power grid was taken out because of a cyber attack. And a lot of people believe that that can happen here as well. Although I, I see things and I read articles that people say that they have made great improvements to it. A lot of other people say that it's not that hard if you're tied into the internet uh, and a lot of these, you know, grids and substations and uh, a lot of them are tied into the internet. If you have that connection, then you're vulnerable. And so, um, you know, that's the thing to, uh, you know, that's, I think that's one reason why people are always talking about the power and electric grid and stuff. Cause not only it used to always just be EMP and solar flare, but now it's, it's cyber attack. And so, you know, if it was cyber, if, if the grid was uh, attacked, um, you know, through the internet somehow, oh, how bad could they destroy it? Could they, could it be like the Ukraine where they get it up uh, very, very quickly, or could they damage it so much to where uh, you couldn't get it repaired uh, within weeks or months? That would be really, really bad. 
one of the other things that I wanted to just, what, as I was reading this and thinking about this, um, what if a solar flare happened on just a portion of the United States, right? So what if a solar flare, um, maybe like a rogue nation, right? The little short man in, in, in uh, North Korea, somehow in one of his submarines or one of, you know, a cargo uh, container or whatever, you know, comes close to the, uh, to the United States, to the eastern uh, coast, east coast, and he shoots off, uh, you know, uh, a, a smaller missile with an EMP and blows it up and over over the east coast and so the east coast goes dark and the eastern uh interconnection uh electric grid goes goes uh goes dark but the western grid is fine and then also the uh the texas grid is fine so you think about all those people that would be migrating eventually i mean there'd be a lot of death people would be sticking around because they'd be you know hey we're gonna rescue is coming blah 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 all that kind of stuff but a lot of people who know will probably be migrating over to the west or to or or to Texas, you know. So you'd have a a big big influx of people coming that way. So that's something I never really hear people talk about that one. If if just the uh, uh, an EMP or solar flare just hit one part of the United States. So that's a kind of an interesting thought. Maybe uh, an article for someone to write out there. So there's a lot of links in this article over at Common Sense Homesteading. Uh, a lot of links to go check out, graphics that you might be inter interested in. And then again, if you have an EMP question, you might want to drop it in the comments section and let August uh, go ahead and answer that for you and, uh, you know, approach it from what he uh, what he's done in his research and, and uh, you know, see what he comes up with there for you on that one. So, again, that's over at Common Sense Homesteading uh, or CommonSenseHome.com. All right. So, hey, thanks so much for being with us uh, on this podcast for episode 152. Uh, I do appreciate you when you share out the podcast. Uh, we make it very easy for you uh, on the website. Uh, we have all the social media channels there. I'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, you can always hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can come over to episode 152 or any other episodes and leave a comment in the comments section. All right. So with that, Choose to live a more self-reliant life. Choose not to be so dependent on the government grid or the grind. Until tomorrow, stay prepped and aware. Peace.